Welcome to the What Health Care Providers Need to Know About Information Sharing and the Information Blocking Regulation webinar number three. My name is Tom with Kaufman and Associates and will be assisting with the logistical support for this Zoom session. To provide comments, please open the chat box, which is located towards the bottom part of your screen. Click on the talk bubble icon and this will pull up the chat box, which will open to the right side of your Zoom interface. Please use the raise hand function under reactions and we will unmute your line to verbally ask questions if there is time for a Q&A portion of the session. Additionally, we ask that you select the speaker view option located at the top right side of your Zoom interface. This will allow you to see the speaker as they present or share information. If you need technical assistance during the session, please type the issue into the chat box and one of our techs will respond. Finally, please be aware that today's session is being recorded. Closed captioning is available by clicking the CC icon at the bottom of your screen. I will now turn it over to Cassie Weaver. Thanks very much. Welcome everyone. Good afternoon. Good morning to those of you who are on Mountain Time and welcome to the first session of this ONC annual meeting. My name is Cassie Weaver and I'll be one of your speakers today for this webinar. We are grateful you're here today and we're excited to talk about with you about information blocking and how the regulations support the sharing of electronic health information. Today is our third webinar in a series of webinars designed to help one particular set of actors, healthcare providers, better understand the information blocking regulations. But even if you're not a healthcare provider, we believe the information provided today will, help, will be helpful to all of those subject to the information blocking regulations, as well as those who aren't subject to them but can still benefit from the regulations themselves. So to start with the refresher, the purpose of these webinars is to provide an overview of information blocking and also to highlight key considerations for actors covered by information blocking. It's also to address recent frequently asked questions, questions from stakeholders that we wanted to respond to via a broader audience. And also these webinars will help highlight the benefits of information sharing as supported by the information blocking regulations. This is the third webinar in the series, as I mentioned. The first was an overview of information blocking, an information blocking 101 that we had held on September 14th, 2021. And the second webinar was held on November 17th, 2021. And in that webinar, we covered four of the eight information blocking exceptions. Today, we aim to cover the remaining four. If you'd like to go back and listen, the recordings for the previous two webinars are available on our website, healthit.gov. This webinar will also be recorded we will probably not be taking live questions just given the amount of content we'll be covering, um, but you're welcome to submit questions through the Q&A feature at the bottom of your screen, which is enabled for this presentation. I also wanna mention that tomorrow, Thursday, February 3rd, we are having an Ask ONC about information sharing session from 12 p.m. to 1.45 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. And the registration link to that is also available on the events page of our website, healthit.gov. We've held similar sessions in the past that have been really well received and well, well attended. So I encourage you all to attend that as well if possible. Um, with that, let's move to the next slide, please. So here are our general disclaimers. You can read this slide for yourself, but the main takeaway is we'll try our best today to present accurate information, but sometimes we misspeak. So please remember that the official provisions and requirements can be found in 45 CFR part 171. Also, because of the amount of information we're trying to convey in a relatively short period of time, some of what I say will be a summary of the regulatory text. I always try to note when I'm summarizing, but when in doubt, definitely refer to the regulatory text, please. Um, next slide, please. As I said earlier, my name is Cassie Weaver. I'm a policy analyst and attorney in the Regulatory Affairs Division of ONC, specifically in the Compliance and Administration branch. I'm joined today by my colleague, Grace Castro, who is also an attorney and is in the same branch that I am. In addition, we're honored today to be joined by a member of our clinical council, nurse consultant Laverne Purley, a health scientist and registered nurse with both a Bachelor of Science degree in nursing as well as a Master of Science degree in Nursing Informatics. She's part of our clinical council here at ONC, and that clinical council helps all of us better convey the goals and expectations of information blocking regulations to our healthcare provider community and to all of our stakeholders as well. They also provide us with an important perspective and particular expertise that we need to do our jobs effectively. 
In this regard, we thought it was appropriate to recognize the whole ONC clinical council team that contributes to this effort. Next slide, please. My colleagues on this slide, led by Dr. Tom Mason, have been constantly engaging with clinicians and the healthcare provider community to get a better sense of the issues you all are facing in implementing the information blocking regulations. We want to acknowledge their efforts and to let you, clinicians, know that your perspectives and concerns are being represented by these clinicians and brought back to ONC for full consideration. Next slide, please. With that, let's lay out the learning objectives for this webinar. Today, we'll be discussing the remaining four exceptions that were not covered in our last webinar. First, I'll begin by discussing the health IT performance exception and the preventing harm exception, and then Grace will cover the privacy and security exceptions. And we'll also let you know where to find more information and educational resources. Laverne will join both of us to lay out some scenarios for us to discuss how each exception might apply. Next slide, please. As a reminder, Congress passed the CARES Act and made information sharing the norm such that actions or omissions, what we call practices, that are likely to interfere with the access, exchange, or use of EHI are no longer acceptable when conducted by certain actors, including healthcare providers. Congress also directed the Department of Health and Human Services to establish exceptions to that norm, to allow for reasonable and necessary practices that would otherwise be an interference to be covered by specific exceptions and provide assurances to the actor that that practice will not be considered information blocking. As a reminder, all of the exceptions are voluntary. They are not required. If an actor's practice doesn't meet all the conditions of an exception, that does not necessarily mean it is information blocking. Any allegation of information blocking would need to be investigated and will be determined on a case-by-case -case basis taking into consideration the specific facts and circumstances of the situation. At our last webinar, we discussed all of the exceptions applicable to the procedures for fulfilling requests to access, exchange, or use electronic health information. And we also discussed the infeasibility exception, one of five exceptions that are applicable to situations where an actor's practice delays, restricts, or denies access, exchange, or use of EHI. Today, we'll discuss the other four exceptions that also fit into this category. Next slide, please. Also today, we are going to use some real world examples to explain how the exceptions may apply. Let me add now that these are example scenarios and as always, any allegation of information blocking would depend on the specific facts and circumstances. We also have a reminder here of the elements of information blocking, which I'll quickly go over as a reminder. In order for a practice to be considered information blocking, it must not be required by law, not be covered by an exception. It must be likely to interfere with or actually interfere with the access, exchange, or use of electronic health information. The practice must be undertaken by an actor, which is a healthcare provider, a health IT developer of certified health IT or a health information network or health information exchange. And that actor must also have the requisite knowledge, which for healthcare providers is that they know the action was unreasonable and is likely to interfere with such access exchange or use. For ease of discussion today, our samples focus on the likelihood of a practice being an interference. But again, practice is likely to interfere are information blocking only if they meet all elements of the definition of information blocking. And with that, let's get started. Next slide, please. Um, so again, when discussing um, the information blocking exceptions, some, in some instances, there are documentation that should be taken in the regular course of the workflow, but failure to meet an exception doesn't mean it's information blocking, and the actor's documented records should reflect what will be needed to demonstrate that the actor met each of the conditions and requirements of the exception. There's a lot of built-in flexibility to allow actors to determine where and when to document specific types and pieces of information. Next slide, please. The first exception I'll discuss is the health IT performance exception. And this exception covers practices that are reasonable and necessary to maintain and improve the overall performance of health IT, provided certain conditions are met. 
This, this exception applies to both planned and unplanned maintenance and improvement. There's four conditions that could be met in order to satisfy this exception. First, maintenance improvements to health I, maintenance and improvements to health IT, which you can see in the yellow box is the first one I'll be discussing. When an actor implements a practice that makes health IT under that actor's control temporarily unavailable or temporarily degrades the performance of health IT in order to perform maintenance or improvements to the health IT, then it won't be considered information blocking if it also satisfied some subconditions, which I'll summarize as being no longer than necessary, implemented in a consistent and non-discriminatory manner, and if it's initiated by a health IT developer of certified health IT, a health information exchange or a health information network, and it is planned, it has to be consistent with the existing service level agreements between them and their customer. If it's unplanned, it has to be consistent with service level agreements, or it has to be agreed to by the individual or entity to whom the developer or HIN or HIE supplied the health IT. That's the first sub-exception. The second, which we call assured level of performance, covers practices when an actor takes action against a third-party app that is negatively impacting the health IT's performance. In these cases, the practice must be for no longer than necessary to resolve any negative impact. It must be implemented in a consistent and non-discriminatory manner, and again, must be consistent with existing service level agreements where applicable. The third sub-exception covers practices that prevent harm. In other words, if the health IT is made unavailable for maintenance or improvements by an actor who undertook that practice in response to a risk of harm to a patient or another person, the actor does not need to satisfy the requirements of this exception, but does need to comply with the conditions in the preventing harm exception at all relative times in order to qualify for that exception. Similarly, the final sub-exception relates to practices where an actor makes health IT unavailable for maintenance or improvements in response to a security risk to EHI. In that case, like the previous one, the actor doesn't need to satisfy the conditions of this exception. Instead, the actor must comply with all the requirements of the security exception at all relevant times to qualify for that exception. And that exception, the security exception, my colleague Grace is going to discuss later on in today's presentation. Next slide, please. Cassie, I have a question for you. If I'm experiencing a significant impact on the performance of my health IT because of the behavior of a third party application, how can I use throttling on certain health IT functions to maintain the performance of my health IT without being considered an information blocker? Thanks so much for this question. And it's a great example um, because it, it really shows the different elements that would need to be met for this exception. So as a quick review for folks who might not know, throttling just means limiting the bandwidth available to users um, in order to better control the environment of the health IT. So in some circumstances, it may be appropriate for actors to take action to limit the negative impact on the performance of the health IT that could result from the technical design, the features, the behavior of a third-party app. Um, and this would include, but not be limited to, third-party applications that the patient might choose to use to access their EHI. So long, in this example, as the practice is for no longer um, of a period of time that is necessary to resolve any negative impacts and is implemented in a consistent and non-discriminatory manner and is consistent with existing service level agreements if um, applicable, then yes, the actor could use throttling on certain health IT functions to maintain the performance of their health IT. Um, for example, if the service level agreement stated how and to what extent negative impacts should be addressed, for example, over capacity, then it's expected that the provisions of that existing service level agreement would be followed unless they violated one of the other requirements of the assured level of performance condition. Um, so the specific requirements for action against a third party application to meet the condition um, of this exception and be accepted from the information blocking requirements parallel the uh, requirements 
for um, the condition applicable to practices that make health IT temporarily unavailable for purposes of maintenance and improvement. So it's a similar sort of required set of requirements for both of those first two that you see along the right-hand side of this slide. Um, and with that, we will move to the next slide and the next exception, please. The preventing harm exception. So this is one that we get a lot of questions about, and I am going to spend um, quite a bit of time on this slide just to really dig in to this exception and hopefully answer some of these questions that we get so often. So the preventing harm exception allows an actor to interfere with the access, exchange, or use of electronic health information based on a reasonable belief that the practice will substantially reduce a risk of harm to a patient or another natural person that would otherwise arise from the access, exchange, or use of that EHI affected by the practice, provided all the other conditions of the exception are met. Please note the risk does not have to be eminent. And as a reminder, like all of the exceptions, this exception is voluntary. I may say must or other words like that when discussing this slide, but I only mean that in the context of meeting the exception, not as a general rule or requirement that actors must undertake. The conditions that must be met to satisfy this exception are shown here in the boxes in the lower left-hand corner. First in yellow, the condition that the actor must hold a reasonable belief that the practice will substantially reduce a risk of harm and that the actor's practice must be no broader than necessary. The middle blue box adds that the practice must satisfy at least one condition from each of the following categories, type of risk, type of harm, and implementation basis. And finally, the dark blue box on the bottom notes that the practice has to satisfy the condition concerning a patient's right to request review of an individualized determination of risk of harm when that is the risk of harm that is being addressed. So I'm gonna go back to that middle blue box and break down the type of risk, the type of harm and explain the implementation basis. So beginning with the type of risk, there are two different types of risks that this preventing harm exception considers. The first type of risk is one that is determined on an individualized basis in the exercise of professional judgment by a licensed healthcare professional who has a current or prior clinician patient relationship with the patient whose electronic health information is affected by the determination. Or the type of risk has to arise from bad data, which is data that is known or reasonably suspected to be misidentified, mismatched, corrupt, or otherwise erroneous. So that's the type of risk and the practice has to satisfy one of those two from that category. Next are the types of harm that we recognize. The types of harm recognized in this exception rely on the same types as apply for a covered entity to deny access to protected health information under the HIPAA privacy rule. There are four different conditions under type of harm and which one applies depends on a number of factors. The first condition applies to situations where the practice is likely to, or does in fact, interfere with the access, exchange, or use of, e of the patient's EHI by their legal representative, including but not limited to their personal representative, and the practice is implemented pursuant to an individualized determination of risk of harm. In other words, that type of risk is determined on an individualized basis in the exercise of professional judgment by a licensed healthcare professional with the current or prior clinician patient relationship with that patient whose EHI is affected by the determination. This is not a bad data type of risk. In this situation, where a patient's personal representative would like to access, exchange, or use the patient's EHI, the licensed healthcare professional may use their professional judgment and determine on an individualized basis that the provision of that access is reasonably likely to cause substantial harm to the patient, the patient's legal representative, or to another person. So the standard in this situation is substantial harm. It is not physical harm, it's substantial harm. The second condition for type of harm 
applies to situations where the practice is likely to, or in fact does interfere with the patient or their legal representatives access, exchange, or use of EHI that references another person. And the practice is implemented pursuant to an individualized risk of harm. So here it's not bad data, again, it's the individualized risk and the patient or their representative is looking to get access, exchange or use information in the patient's EHI, but the information within that patient's EHI references another person. In this case, the licensed healthcare professional determines that the access is reasonably likely to cause substantial harm to that other person. So again, the standard here is substantial harm. There does not need to be a risk of physical harm to that other person for the practice to satisfy this exception, just a risk of substantial harm. The third condition applies to situations where the practice is likely to, or in fact does, interfere with the patient's access exchange or use of their own EHI. In this instance, the risk of harm that the practice is implemented to substantially reduce to reduce to substantially reduce can either be determined on an individualized basis or it could arise from bad data. In this case, where the practice interferes with the patient's access, exchange, or use of their own EHI about the patient herself, the practice has to be used to substantially reduce the risk of harm that is reasonably likely to endanger the life or physical safety of either the patient or of another person. So in this situation, the harm that is being reduced must be a risk of, must be reasonably likely to endanger the life or physical safety. So this is about a physical harm. Finally, the fourth condition, and right now I'm talking about this dark or this blue box right in the middle, um, and I'm discussing the type of harm categories. So the fourth condition and the type of harm that applies to it can be thought of as a bit of a catch-all. It applies to situations where the practice is likely to, or in fact does, interfere with some other legally permissible access, exchange, or use of EHI. In other words, it's not necessarily initiated by a patient or a patient's representative. In this case, the practice must substantially reduce a harm that is reasonably likely to endanger the life or physical safety of either the patient or of another person. As in the previous condition, here that risk can arise from either bad data or can be determined on an individualized basis by a licensed healthcare professional who has a current or prior clinician-patient relationship with the patient whose EHI is affected by the determination. So in this situation, there's also a requirement that the risk of harm be a risk of physical harm. Finally, the implementation basis in that blue box in the middle means that the practice has to be implemented in a specific way. Either there has to be an organizational policy that meets certain requirements, which I'll summarize as saying it's in writing based on relevant expertise and implemented in a consistent and non-discriminatory manner, or the implementation basis can be individualized in the exercise of professional judgment by a licensed healthcare professional who has a current or prior clinician-patient relationship, and it must be based on facts and circumstances known or reasonably believed at the time the determination is made. Finally, any practice under this exception has to be consistent with any rights the individual patient whose EHI is effective is affected may have under the privacy rules review of denial of access when the interference made is made based on an individualized basis. In other words, the patient has the right to appeal the denial of access when it's made on an individualized basis, not necessarily, um, and not when the type of risk comes from bad data. So I know that was a lot. I encourage you all to read the regulatory text for this because a lot of questions can be answered by taking whatever scenario you're imagining and walking your specific fact pattern through these conditions. Who's asking for it? Whose EHI is it? Is the EHI discussing another person, et cetera? So let's talk through an example of this that I think will hopefully be really helpful um, in explaining the preventing harm exception. So can we get to the next slide, please? <clears throat> 
Cassie, my ICU patient dies without their spouse and, was, and their spouse was not able to be in the hospital with them. In my professional judgment, it is reasonably likely that the patient's spouse will suffer substantial psychological or emotional harm from first learning uh, via a portal or an app that their spouse has died. My question is, can the preventing harm exception cover delaying availability of patient death information in the portal or application programming interface until I or a fellow clinician can break the news to them in real time? Yes, absolutely. This is a case where the preventing harm exception will cover that interference. As a nurse, you are a healthcare professional and in your professional judgment, you have determined that it's reasonably likely that providing that EHI to the patient's spouse, their personal representative, will cause them substantial psychological or emotional harm. So you've satisfied the reasonable belief, the type of risk, and the type of harm. Also, you implemented your practice based on a determination specific to these facts and circumstances. So you have satisfied all of the six conditions of this exception, and I don't think anyone would disagree that it is reasonably likely that this patient's spouse would suffer substantial psychological or emotional harm from learning about it through a portal rather than when they arrive at the hospital. Um, so just to point out a few other aspects of this, it does not need to be a doctor. It can be a, any healthcare professional who has this um, opinion and who has the reasonable belief here to, that delaying it would meet the exception or that delaying it would um, reduce the risk of substantial psychological or emotional harm, in which case, yes, all the conditions of this exception will have been satisfied and it would not be considered information blocking to interfere with that access by delaying um, putting the information into the portal or making it available through the API until you have the time to break the news to them in real time. So I sincerely hope that helped. Um, if you do have questions about this exception, uh, feel free to put them in the Q&A or join us tomorrow for our open office hours. For now, I'm going to hand this over to my colleague, Grace, to cover the remaining two exceptions. Thanks so much. Thanks, Cassie. Uh, can everybody hear me okay? Um, looks like it, great. Uh, hi, everybody. My name is Grace Castro. And uh, like Cassie mentioned, I'm a policy analyst and an attorney here in the compliance and administration branch at ONC. It's my pleasure to be with you today. Uh, so let's jump right in to the next slide, please. Okay, so let's talk about the privacy exception. Um, in our final rule, we stated that the information blocking provision does not require that actors provide access, exchange, or use of EHI in a manner that is not already permitted under the HIPAA privacy rule or other laws. So the privacy protective controls existing under the HIPAA rules, uh, they're not weakened by the information blocking provision. We also structured the privacy exception to ensure that actors can engage in reasonable and necessary practices that advance the privacy interests of individuals. So let's move now to the overview of the privacy exception. It will not be information blocking if an actor does not fulfill a request to access, exchange, or use EHI in order to protect an individual's privacy, provided that certain conditions are met. So if you look at the box on the bottom left, you'll see that there are several steps uh, to satisfy the privacy exception. So to satisfy the privacy exception, an actor's privacy protective practice must, in the yellow there, satisfy at least one of the following four sub exceptions and meet all of the conditions applicable to a sub exception that's being relied upon. And as you can see here um, in those kind of their pale yellow, I'd call it pale yellow, um, there are four possible sub exceptions that can be used under the privacy exception. 
I think about these four sub exceptions kind of as like top layers, right? Kind of like the layers to an onion. Um, each of these four top layers has layers beneath it that must be met in order to qualify for the privacy exception. And we're gonna talk about a couple of those in some more detail. Um, unfortunately, I don't have time to get super deep into the weeds on each of them um, for today's presentation, but we are gonna touch on a couple of them. I will say though, if you are interested in learning more about what is explicitly required for each of these top layers, um, please see that regulatory text or the preamble text in our final rule. We go into a lot of detail about the elements that are required to meet each of these sub exceptions. So with that, let's move to the next slide, please. Okay. An actor's practice of not fulfilling a request to access exchange or use EHI in order to protect an individual's privacy will not be considered information blocking when the practice meets all of the requirements of at least one of these four sub exceptions. So the first one um, is precondition not satisfied. And that is really a precondition that's required by law is not satisfied. This piece recognizes that there may be things that you as a provider are required to do before you disclose information to a particular requester. So to draw um, a quick distinction, you know, we know that the HIPAA privacy rule does not have an individual consent requirement for uses and disclosure, disclosures of PHI for the purposes of treatment, payment, and healthcare operations. However, uh, maybe you are a provider who operates in a state where the law requires you to get patient consent before the patient's EHI can be accessed, exchanged, or used for specific purposes, let's say. Um, the information blocking regulation does not say that you have to, you must disclose if there's also a state or a federal law that says you have to get permission to disclose first. That's something we get lots of questions about. So um, just wanna say that off the top, but you know, for clarity, um, I do want to remind actors that in order to qualify for this particular sub exception, um, an actor cannot just never ask the patient for the patient's consent and say, oh, well, the patient never gave me consent and then expect to meet this particular sub exception, right? Um, you know, for instance, one of the conditions for this particular sub exception is that when the state or federal law requires consent and the actor has an incomplete or an outdated consent, we're going to talk about that uh, a little more here in a second. I'd also point out uh, this sub exception might be of interest to an actor that operates in multiple states, right? Under this particular sub exception, the actor could either choose to comply with the laws of each state in which it operates, or the actor could choose to comply with the most restrictive state law in which it operates. And of course, you know, we're applicable, the actor will always need to comply with federal law requirements, right? But here, there are a couple things I'd like to draw your attention to, right? So if you are an actor that operates in multiple states, um, the actor will need to document which approach it is adopting and implementing in its policies and procedures as one of the conditions. And by that, I mean, is the actor complying with the laws in each state or is it complying with the most restrictive state law? So we're gonna need to document that. I'd also flag here that the, you know, taking that uniform approach is not gonna be available to actors that choose to operate on a case by case basis without policies and procedures that are detailed uh, in this particular exception. Actors without uniform policies and procedures are gonna need to comply with each of the applicable state and federal laws as well. Moving on to the next um, sub oh, I'm sorry, nope, please stay on that slide. <laughs> sorry, <laughs> thank you. Um, yeah, the sub it says C there. I have it in my notes as number two, but uh, the health IT developer of certified health IT not covered by HIPAA. So this one is really only relevant to a specific class and that's gonna be healthcare providers, or excuse me, I'm sorry, health IT developers. 
This one really only applies to health IT developers. So I'm going to skip to that number D, number D, letter D, um, denial of an individual's request for the EHI consistent with 45 CFR 164A1 and 2. Uh, so Cassie just talked about how the preventing harm exception uses the HIPAA privacy rule reviewable grounds for denial. The privacy exception in general aligns with the HIPAA privacy rules unreviewable grounds of denial. And this particular uh, sub exception specifically aligns with the HIPAA right of access. So if you need to brush up on what constitutes an unreviewable grounds for denial, those are available at 45 CFR 164.524 A1 and 2. E um, is respecting the individual's request not to share information. So this one recognizes that if the patient just asks the provider to not share the information, uh, and as long as that provider stays within the guardrails here and meets all, excuse me, meets all the other conditions, then honoring that patient's request is not going to be information blocking. There's also uh, a common misunderstanding that I want to clear up here. Uh, the patient does not have to have a particular reason, and the provider does not have to agree with the patient's decision to keep that information confidential. There is also no harm requirement for this particular sub-exception. So that, that makes this particular sub-exception different than the preventing harm exception, right? Um, for this sub-exception under privacy, the patient can just decide that they don't want to share that information for whatever reason. And as long as the provider follows all of the other conditions in this exception, there's a couple of them, but as long as the provider follows all of those, the provider can decline to share this information and still meet this exception. Um, however, you know, of course, I want to note there that an individual's expressed privacy preferences will not be controlling in every single case. You know, for instance, an actor will not be able to rely on the individual's expressed privacy consent, or excuse me, expressed privacy preference in circumstances where the access exchange or use of that EHI is required by law. Um, one example that comes to mind is something like a state law that requires mandatory reporting of sexually transmitted infections to the state public health department or something like that, right? Okay, with that, let's move to the next slide, please. Thank you, Grace. Um, I have two questions for you about the using the privacy exception. As a provider, a patient requested that I disclose their electronic health information regarding a sensitive health condition. My state requires an individual's consent to disclose such information. The consent that the patient provided did not satisfy all of the legal requirements for disclosure. Can I use the precondition not satisfied subsection to deny the request? Um, probably not. This situation sounds like it would fit into the precondition required by law is not satisfied sub exception. But I would say no, because it sounds like the actor here has an imperfect consent or an authorization from the patient. Um, the regulatory text that I'm talking about here, it's available at 171.202b. But in summary, if the precondition required by law relies on getting a consent or an authorization from an individual and the actor received like a version of such consent that doesn't satisfy all of the elements that are required under the law, then the actor must do two things. First, the actor must use reasonable efforts within its control to provide that individual with a consent or an authorization form that satisfies all of the required elements of the precondition or provide uh, other reasonable assistance to the individual to satisfy all of the required elements of the precondition. Second, the actor should not properly, excuse me, should not improperly encourage or induce that individual to withhold the consent or the authorization. So the final rule does not require the actor that receives that request in this case to do 
all of the things reasonably necessary within its control to obtain a patient's consent or you know to provide that individual with a meaningful opportunity to provide the consent right the final rule does require that the actor is obligated to take reasonable steps to provide a sufficient consent or provide other reasonable assistance so providing reasonable assistance does not mean that an actor needs to chase down every individual to obtain a sufficient consent or an authorization right um some reasonable assistance things might include notifying the individual of the elements that are missing in the consent or the authorization that they initially provided sometimes that's things like a witness or an expiration date if it's legally required right um that said, uh, we do also have an exception that allows an actor to abide by a patient's request to not exchange data. So let's maybe move to the next question. Thanks, Grace. As a provider, my patient explicitly asked me to not share their social determinants of health data with anyone, but did not elaborate on their reasoning for wanting to keep that information confidential. My state does not require me to get specific consent to disclose social determinants of health data to my patients, other healthcare providers. Can I use the privacy exception in this instance to not share my patients' social determinants of health data? Yeah, so that's a great question. Um, I would say this one falls definitely under that patient request to keep their information private um, privacy sub exception and that like like we're talking about that sub exception can apply where a provider seeks to honor a patient's request that certain electronic health information be withheld from someone to whom disclosure would be permissible under applicable law right under this particular sub exception, you know, patients can always change their mind later on if they choose to. And of course, you know, the actor will need to respect that change of mind if and when it happens. But for now, you know, let's say that this patient doesn't want to share their data and they make that preference known to the provider. This exception is going to allow for patients who are able to give or withhold their consent for access, exchange, or use of EHI to request that the provider not share some or maybe even all of that information when the following three conditions are met. So first, the individual requests that the actor not provide such access exchange or use of EHI without any improper encouragement or inducement of the request by that actor, okay? Um, second, the actor documents this request within a reasonable time period. And third, that the actor's practice is implemented in a consistent and non-discriminatory manner. So if all three of those conditions are met, um, this looks like a candidate to be able to apply that um, respecting the patient's request, sub-exception of the privacy exception. Next slide, please. Okay, so let's talk a little bit about the security exception. We recognize that robust security protections are critical, you know, particularly when it comes to promoting patients and other stakeholders' trust and confidence that EHI is going to be collected, used, and shared in a manner that protects the individual's privacy and that you know complies with applicable legal requirements. So the overarching purpose of the security exception is to provide flexibility for actors, for them to use reasonable and necessary security practices, while also screening out the practices that assert that they promote the security of EHI, but in reality, unreasonably and or unnecessarily interfere with the access exchange and use of EHI. So for instance, unreasonable or unnecessary interference can include practices that you know, assert that they promote security of EHI, but they're actually unreasonably broad or they're onerous on those seeking to access EHI. You know, perhaps 
those practices are not applied consistently across or within an organization um, or you know they otherwise unreasonably interfere with that access exchange and use so this exception is intended to cover all legitimate security practices by an actor but i do want to make it very clear this exception does not prescribe a maximum level of security it also does not dictate a one size fits all approach so while it is true you know that the importance of security practices can't be overstated the security exception itself the security exception for the information blocking regulation does not apply to all practices that assert that they secure EHI. Rather, the exception is available when the actor's security-based practices meets the conditions that are outlined in this exception. So moving now to that box, that box on the left towards the middle bottom of the slide there, you'll see to satisfy this exception, an actor's security-related practice has to meet some conditions, right? In the yellow, it must be directly related to safeguarding the confidentiality, integrity, and availability of EHI. It also, you know, moving to the uh, middle blue box, must be tailored to specific security risks. Also, move down to the dark blue box, must be implemented in a consistent and non-discriminatory manner. And finally, moving down to the light yellow, excuse me, light blue, it must either implement a qualifying organizational security policy or implement a qualifying security determination. So with that, uh, let's move to the next slide, please. Grace, I have two questions. Okay. I am a hospital with a very robust data security program. I have specific concerns about the data security of a physician practice in my area. Will the security exception cover my denying that doctor access to electronic health information of patients we both treat in order to better protect the EHI from a potential breach? So this one, as it stands, I would say it depends, right? Um, in this particular case, I'd say that the timing and the type of connection are both going to be relevant here. So for instance, um, if the actor has concerns that are tailored to a specific security risk of the hospital system, or um, if the actor is concerned about a potential breach of EHI during the transfer of the EHI, then yes, that's a potentially appropriate use of the security exception. And here, I would say the type of connection matters. Um, and if there are identified and tailored specific security risks. That's really when we're looking to apply that security exception. However, um, if the actor just has generalized concerns or, you know, they're concerned about data security generally, you know, like, for instance, maybe the actor is concerned about a potential breach of EHI, you know, once it's in the hands of that other provider after that secure transfer of EHI is completed. Um, you know, in that case, the actor is unlikely to meet that tailored to specific security risks element of the security exception. So if if that's the situation, then the actor probably can't qualify for the security exception there. Um, and my last question. My patient wants me to release their EHI to a third party app that they have chosen. I'm satisfied I can release the EHI without compromising my system or legal obligations under HIPAA. But my reputation will suffer if I let patients send their electronic health information to an app that then gets breached. Will the security exception cover my refusing to release the patient's EHI as long as I do the same for every app 
I have accessed or I haven't assessed for security, or if I am not satisfied with how the app handles electronic health information once it's in that app. So for this particular circumstance, no, the security exception is not going to cover an actor in this particular scenario. Um, and there's a couple elements here. I'm going to try to organize my thoughts. Um, the first one is that uh, the Office of Civil Rights, OCR, released a HIPAA FAQ covering the situation, right? Um, OCR is the agency um, that oversees the HIPAA rules. They released an FAQ covering the situation and indicated that as long as someone is not a covered entity or a business associate, then the actor is not gonna be liable under HIPAA. Um, I get the, in summation of that particular FAQ, what they really say is once, in, once health information is received from a covered entity, at the individual's discretion by an app. Um, when the app is neither a covered entity nor a business associate under HIPAA, that information is no longer subject to the protection of the HIPAA rules. So if the individual's app, you know, something that's chosen by an individual to receive the individual's requested EPHI, if that was not provided by or on behalf of the covered entity, meaning that it does not create, receive, transmit, or maintain the EPHI on behalf of the covered entity, then the covered entity would not be liable under the HIPAA rules for any subsequent use or disclosure of the requested EPHI that's received by the app. So, you know, for example, the covered entity would not have any HIPAA responsibilities or liability if such an app that the individual designates to receive their EPHI later than experiences a breach. However, um, an actor can still educate patients about third-party apps without creating an interference under the information blocking rules, um, but there are conditions that have to be met. So when the education meets certain criteria, we will not consider that to be an interference under information blocking. First, um, the information that's provided by actors must focus on any current privacy and or security risks that are posed by the technology or the third party developer of that technology. Second, the information must be factually accurate, unbiased, objective, and not unfair or deceptive. And third, the information must be provided in a non-discriminatory manner. So, for example, all third-party apps must be treated the same way in terms of whether or not information education is provided to individuals about the privacy and security practices that are employed. And to be clear, um, an actor may not prevent an individual from deciding to provide their own EHI to a technology developer or an app, um, despite any risks that are noted regarding the app itself or the third party developer. And when it comes to education and educating patients in this way, um, if, if there was a claim of information blocking that was filed, ONC or OIG um, as applicable, could review an actor's practices that assert that they're educating patients about the privacy and security practices of applications and parties to whom patients choose to receive their EHI. So with that, um, next slide, please. So where you can find more information, um, we are constantly uh, updating and trying very, very hard to get you guys as many resources as possible. We have a really great and ever-growing collection of educational resources. Uh, of course, you can always visit our website, um, www.healthit.gov slash cures rule. There you will find all kinds of things. We have fact sheets, we have FAQs, we have blogs, we have webinars. Um, and there on the screen, you can see kind of some screenshots of what our website looks like. 
But if you are interested and want to receive more information, I really encourage you to please check out these links. Um, we have a lot, a lot, a lot of information there and we are constantly trying to bring you more as much as we can. Um, so please check those out if you have time. Uh, next slide, please. what to do if you are experiencing information blocking. So just for um, clarity for everybody, the 21st Century Cures Act directs the national coordinator to implement a standardized process for the public to submit claims of potential information blocking. Um, and a report of potential information blocking can be submitted through the report information blocking portal. The link uh, is there below, but it is healthit.gov slash report dash info dash blocking. Um, next slide, please. Also for everybody's awareness, uh, we do have some upcoming events in particular um, that I'm really looking forward to is Ask ONC about information sharing. That is February 3rd, 2022, that's tomorrow. Uh, at 12 p.m. There is a link, I believe, in the chat um, about if you want to register for it. Um, you can see me there and uh, other members of the ONC team. We're going to be answering your questions um, to the, as much as we can uh, about your, you know, information blocking in general um, to the extent that we can. Also, um, this year's ONC annual meeting will be held from April 13th and 14, it's gonna be held on April 13th and 14th, 2022. So for more information about upcoming webinars and events, you can always subscribe to the ONC email updates uh, on www.healthit.gov. Next slide, please. As always, um, if you have any questions, please feel free to contact us. Our information is uh, up here on the slide. And with that, um, I will wrap us up for today. Thank you so much for your time and your attention. I hope it was helpful. Um, and we hope to see you tomorrow at the Ask ONC About Information Sharing event at 12 o'clock. Um, and with that, I hope you have a nice day. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, everyone. And thank you, Laverne, for joining us today. We yes, really appreciate definitely. it. Definitely. Thank you, Laverne. We thank appreciate you. you. <laughs> thank you, everyone.